Okay. We're ready? Ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Health of the Law Society tonight for what I think will be a very interesting discussion. Um, I sent an earl, uh, email out earlier with all of our speakers' bios. If you didn't receive that, I can forward that to you. Just let me know. Um, some logistics for the discussion. If you have any questions, we decided we're just going to have them all wait till the end. So if you have any questions, you can just feel free to chat me or just put it in the chat for everyone and we'll get there at the end. And Rick, I'll hand over to you to introduce everyone. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Zonloiter, and I have been the general counsel of the New York State Department of Health in Albany for about five years. And I retired, though, from state service in May of 2020. Uh, before that, I worked for the health department. And way before that, I even went to Albany Law School myself. Uh, so I am an alum. Uh, I want to introduce you to two of my friends. And I think we've got a really solid team with them on board. Uh, one is Axel Burnaby, and he is currently the governor's assistant counsel for health. And that means he works in the executive chamber and uh, he's got a long proficient career too. But just to touch upon the highlights, he has been negotiating the cannabis law bills uh, for a couple of years now. I think this is probably after two fails, his third year. Uh, it reminds me of a Starbucks uh, story about how the owner of Starbucks, I think needed 243 pitches to investors to finally get somebody who could invest in Starbucks. So Axel, hang in there and keep going. We're gonna pass this cannabis bill sooner or later. And I should also say that at the health department, we had uh, jurisdiction over many, many, many matters. The law office that I handled managed was 180 lawyers and other office staff. The Department of Health is about 6,000 people. And among the people in the Department of Health staff is a, a little unit that is called the Medical Marijuana Program. And Nicole Quackenbush, who is a doctor of pharmacy, uh, headed up that program until the time when she left the state service in the fall of 2019. Uh, Nicole is a, a graduate of the Albany College of Pharmacy right next to the Albany Law School. And so she's familiar with the terrain there. And she's got, I think, 22 years of experience uh, after uh, having attained her education. And as I said, she's a doctor of pharmacy. So I might call her Nicole, but I also want to call her Dr. Quackenbush. Um, uh, you also in the audience will have a chance to participate with us because we have several polling questions that each one of us has prepared. And uh, I hope that you contribute what you know and we'll learn from those things too uh, when we get to them. They're embedded in the uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, we'll cover three subjects tonight, uh, sort of mini subjects in the cannabis law field. Uh, I will cover the history of some uh, drug use and anti-drug laws culminating with uh, a product called industrial hemp and the regulatory scheme that goes along with it. Nicole will talk about pharmacology of cannabis and the medical marijuana program. And Axel will talk about the uh, current bill that the governor is sponsoring in uh, the legislature, as well as the adult use part of cannabis and, and also the uh, social equity ramifications of the cannabis bill. The objective, I think, from my perspective tonight is to spark some uh, thoughts in, in you, among you, about advising clients in the cannabis industry and cannabis field. And maybe you'll find things that are interesting and you want to research further. Maybe you'll find things that uh, you want to pursue as a career and you never know. In an interview, uh, maybe you'll be asked when you are applying for that $300,000 a year legal counsel job with one of the major uh, cannabis company, companies in the country, maybe this will help uh, give you some background and some confidence in that career search. Uh, so I, I'd like to start off with the first slide, if possible. Uh, I can't tell, is it up there, Jessica? Now I can tell, okay. Should be now. It's there. 
So I, I've uh, entitled my part, and maybe even the part that we all have, Cannabis Law, the Path to Legalization in New York. And there's some key little concepts in that. Legalization, to me anyway, implies a regulatory framework. There's another word too that's used a lot, decriminalization. And they're different things. Decriminalization is taking away the criminal consequences of committing an offense, a felony or a misdemeanor. Uh, I think we'll, we'll talk eventually about both, but right now I think legalization is the right word. And before I go to the next slide too, I wanted to give you a little uh, piece of my own philosophy. I think I understand subjects better when I get the big picture first and when I also get an idea of the chronology involved. So I can figure out what came in what sequence and where we are at the current point in time and maybe even how we got there. So I, I think you'll see that theme running throughout my uh, following slides. So Jessica, the next slide, please. Uh, I have done some research to prepare for today and, and I've learned that morphine, cocaine and heroin, we all know they're prohibited today by the Controlled Substances Act federally and also in state law. We all know they're illegal, but those psychoactive medicines or compounds, I guess you could call them, have not always been illegal. They have been legal in days gone by, and they've even been used as more than uh, recreational products. They've been used as medicines. So I'd like to start with the 1700s and 1800s. And next slide. So here's a picture. This comes from 1884, and you can see it's two children happily uh, playing with a, a log cabin, I guess, that they're constructing. And uh, it's apparent that the uh, message is that they're happy and perhaps they're happy because they're high on cocaine. And it might sound pretty <laughs> outrageous and it, it probably is. Uh, this was a product that was used to distribute, uh, or this product was distributed and used to uh, quell pain in kids as they had uh, teething issues. And you might see some of the little uh, fine print in there. It says underneath Lloyd Manufacturing Company, 218 Hudson Avenue, Albany, New York. So we're pretty close to home uh, with this advertisement. I even looked up 218 Hudson Avenue right now just to find out where it was today. And it happens to be a location that's buried underneath the Empire State Plaza. So it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, this slide discusses Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. It's from 1887. And you see the little vial up on top of the mom's head and then she's going to give it to her child for teething issues. Uh, this is not cocaine though. This is actually morphine. Uh, product that you know we know is illegal but hasn't always been. And I, I'd like to emphasize how times change and mindsets change. Okay, next slide, Jessica. This slide is an advertisement for something I've never heard of, but it's coca wine. And you can see it's got various medicinal uses, uses uh, described in the ad for fatigue of mind or body. Uh, on the left, it says recommended for neuralgia, sleeplessness, dis despondency. Um, it, it's an interesting product because it combines three intoxicants, not one, not two, but three. Cocaine is one of the ingredients. Uh, wine is another ingredient. And um, I, I'm not sure the fine print is, is there, but I think that alcohol from another source besides grapes is, a, is another ingredient in that product. Um, and uh, let's see, what's the time frame? The time frame would be late 1800s. Let, let's go to the next slide. This is another one of those triple products. It's maltine with coca wine. So this combines cocaine and wine and uh, alcohol from malt, which is one of the products that could be used in uh, beer or, or other types of liquor. Uh, it's been awarded 10 gold medals. Who knows who and what and what even a gold medal is, but you can see that it was a popular product in the 1800s. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I put this one up here because Vin Mariani uh, is one of the, uh, the old time famous wines of the era. 
And of course it has cocaine in it and the Pope endorsed it. How often do you see the Pope endorsing cocaine? And that's what's happened here. Well, let's go to the next slide. I, I like this slide because it's a, mal it's, it's a, a, a bunch of different slides and I, I wanted to show them for different purposes. Uh, this is again from the uh, 1800s, but in the early 1800s, opium came about and was commonly used. In the late 1800s, heroin came about and was commonly used. And one way was for an anti-asthmatic medicine. That's what the picture on the right is about. And you can see that it contains uh, uh, opium. On the left, you can see that the product is a vapor oil. And I, I believe that contains alcohol and opium as well. And there's probably some heroin in there too. Uh, but the idea was you dropped it into that scale, which is the middle picture, that little dish. And then you lit the kerosene lamp that's underneath it, causing the heat to come up. And then the vapor loaded with all of these intoxicants was dispersed uh, throughout the, uh, the place where you were. 1800s and perfectly legal. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. This is the, uh, the era, the time frame that I wanted to talk about chronologically. And it just happens to fit in that in the late 1800s, we had the Spanish-American War. And it, it doesn't really have a direct impact on uh, drugs and drug use, but I wanted to talk about it a little because what happened there was historically, you might remember Cuba was controlled by Spain. There was a, a ship called the Maine that was uh, sunk in the Cuban harbor. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders went down there and, and they charged and it was a big war. Uh, as a result though of this Spanish-American War in late 1898, the United States won. And when the United States won, the United States picked up uh, rights to a couple of territories. Uh, that's how Puerto Rico came into the United States system, also the Philippines came into the American system. And uh, I will um, foreshadow something because we'll come back to this a little later. But the Philippines had a system put in place by the Spanish government back then in the 1890s that supplied opium to opium addicts uh, as part of the, uh, the healing process to recovery. And it was also part of a licensing program. So the United States inherited that opium uh, system that Spain had put in place. Um, so we'll come back. So let's go to the next slide. Let's move into the 1900s now. And I, I think that we'll have the same uh, type of pattern developing, but it's a little bit more recently. So next slide, please. I, I like this slide because it's about bear. It's a product that we know about it. It's a company that we know about, Bayer Aspirin, except that back then they laced it with heroin, a sedative for coughs is what it says in the fine print. And of course you can see that it's in our home state of New York as well. Um, let's go to the, the next slide. Now this is something that I really never uh, heard of myself, Paragoric, but I learned about it. It's produced by a company called Stickney and Poors, which is a spice company. Uh, another company in the day called McCormick also produced uh, spices and a product like this. Look at this product. It contains 46% alcohol as well as opium. And on the back of the bottle, it describes the dose for a child that's five days old, two weeks old, five years old, and then adults. Uh, but this is paragoric, a combination of some pretty heavy duty alcohol and opium, uh, all legal and all used during the uh, early 1900s. So let's go to the next slide. This will be poll question one. And I'm wondering if you're aware of two psychoactive rainforest plants, uh, Banisteriopis and Psychotria. So let's click in yes, no, and we'll get the results pretty quick.
We're getting mostly no's right now. <laughs> no, no yeses. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's good enough for me now, Jessica. I, I'm glad that the answers are mostly no. Is, is that the case? There's not even one yes? There was no yes. Okay. <laughs> that's a great way to say it. Uh, very clever. Um, these two plants are Amazon jungle tropical plants. And, you know, we've been talking about how we've got to preserve the rainforest because there might be plants there with medicine quality material there that would, could be of value to us. These are two plants that are like that. Uh, the jungle supplies them. So let's go to the next poll question. Are you aware of a psychoactive drink known as ayahuasca? And Jessica, let me know when you think that we've got most of the answers in. We got 16 of 18, so I think that's good. We have five yeses. Oh wait, nope, we have everyone. Okay, five yeses, 13 noes. Okay, uh, at least one of those yeses was mine. And I am pretty interested in how the other people who said yes actually have known about ayahuasca. I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, I've never come across it, but I've researched it. So let's go to the next slide. The ayahuasca uh, drink is the product of uh, mixing together the compounds in both of those plants, Banisteriopsis and Psychotria. Banisteriopsis contains a chemical called DMT, dimethyl tri -tryptam dimethyl tryptamine which is an hallucinogenic. Uh, dimethyltryptamine is, is in the controlled substance list and it's a schedule one, I think. So it's illegal, but I don't think it was on the list because of ayahuasca. I think that it was on there for different reasons, but this drink is a combination of the Banisteriopsis plant, mashed up of course, and Psychotria. Uh, Psychotria contains an enzyme inhibitor that actually uh, uh, enhances the effect of the DMT. So what I've learned about this, this uh, medicine, if you will, is that ayahuasca is a product that causes your stomach to become very upset. And when people take the drink, what happens is the DMT starts to work and causes the hallucinogenic effect. But while that happens, the body's own enzymes are uh, attacking the DMT and neutralizing it. So in order to stop the body's own enzymes from attacking the DMT, psychotria is added to the drink and therefore it keeps your body hallucinogenic, but it also stops the enzyme that you naturally have from slowing it down. It's a product that causes severe vomiting and continuous throwing up it's not pretty, but I, I guess that it lasts a long time, like we might even be talking many hours, and it helps people revive their hidden repressed memories, which can help them treat PTSD. Fascinating subject, and if anybody wants to research it further, I think you could write a terrific article about it. But the, uh, the, 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 the mixture is now called a religious drink, and I think people are using it for religious purposes and people are using it also for uh, medicine. But the religious purpose is interesting because they have won several court cases and successfully argued that even though it's Schedule One, their freedom of religion rights to drink this vomiting material <laughs> overrides. And, and so it's, it's illegal, but it's something that's still used as medicine today. And my point is, is that everything is kind of relative. In the past, we might be critical of people using cocaine and other drugs on their babies. But here we're using a drug too that is uh, of unknown origin and may even be uh, a great Amazon plant that we need to know more about. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is early 1900s and uh, Coca-Cola is of course a little famous for having cocaine. And I, I did some research here too. A pharmacist discovered it in 1886 
And I think right through 1905, the product contained cocaine. This label though is from 1906, which is the beginning of the FDA. And you can see in the fine print, maybe if you, I can see it, it says cocaine removed after the ingredient extracts from cocoa leaves. Um, I looked at the Coca-Cola website just for curiosity to see what was going on with this. And they don't mention anything at all about Coke ever having been uh, infused with cocaine. Uh, but as you can see here, the label says that the drink is good for relief of nausea and vomiting. Uh, let's go to the next slide. This is a slide I just put in there. We'll come back to it. But 1913 chronologically came up first. Kentucky uh, at that time argued in favor of retaining a federal duty tax on hemp. And that was because they have a great big hemp crop. And they did in 1913. And they wanted to protect it from foreign uh, crops from Italy and other countries. So I just we will come back to that. So let's go to the next slide. Chronologically at 1914 is where we're at. Federal Harrison Narcotics Act is enacted. Uh, Harrison is a congressman from New York City. So he came a homegrown New York State person. And this act is something that regulated opium or cocoa leaves. So it's cocaine or opium. It didn't regulate it though. What it really did was require that people who sold it and purchased it had to register and pay a tax of a dollar a year. Uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit of the social equity aspect of that because it has some interesting uh, components you may not have known about. There were two prejudices that generated this Harrison Narcotics Act. And I think the, 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 the act linked opium and cocaine violence to Chinese communities and also to African-American communities. Uh, there is a, a 1914 New York Times Magazine article that's entitled, African-American cocaine fiends are now a Southern menace. So you can see the hysteria that was developing the reason for this anti-drug act and this drug war that is, is coming up. Um, they, used, they didn't use the word African-American. I put that in there myself. Well, they used another word. Uh, regarding the, the Chinese communities, New York City had uh, a community called Chinatown and the neighborhood was encroaching on an Irish community next door. There was a Catholic Church of Transfiguration that was there and the Irish pastor at the time uh, put uh, this statement out, which I am quoting now. Many girls who live in this neighborhood have been rumored, uh, I'm sorry, have been ruined by these Chinamen. Children as young as 11 and 12 have been led into the opium dens where they are induced to stupefy themselves with opium. Uh, so it could be said that the legislative history indicates that this was an act enacted for the purpose of keeping uh, opium from the Chinese community and cocaine from the African American community out of uh, the white community. Uh, I raise that, is that, a, is that a possible social equity issue? I'm just ra raising it and uh, we'll talk about it later a little bit more. So I also wanted to mention something else too about this. Uh, the, the, um, the Philippines at the time, as I said, from the 1898 Spanish-American War were um, uh, acquired and there was a bishop from the Episcopal Church that was put there to study uh, the opium use in that country. And the bishop decided that the best way to combat this was to start this anti-drug war. And that's what led to the statute. Uh, there's also a little aspect to the statute that said it was okay for physicians to prescribe opium to recovering addicts. However, law enforcement at the time decided that the phrase that was in the statute in the practice of medicine didn't apply to opium because opium was not a medicine. And so there were a lot of arrests and convictions of physicians. Uh, I guess I'll just pose a question. Does that sound familiar when you're thinking about the drug war that has happened in the recent past in our own country right now? So let's go to the next slide. Um, 1937 is where we're at. And there was something called the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. And these are actual stamps that indicated that you paid the tax. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this tax act 
taxed the entire plant of marijuana except mature stalks uh, or the entire cannabis plant except the mature stalks. I think that that was a reference to uh, the hemp and fabric industry or textile industry. Uh, the requirement was there to register and also pay a tax. That was it. Uh, $24 a year for importers, $3 producers, and anyone who gives the product away had to pay a tax. And I wanted to mention another social equity ramification of this perhaps. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is something that was printed in the Washington Post. And uh, it was of course uh, said in 2016, but it was about the time before 1937 when the um, the, the Marijuana Tax Act was enacted. So this is a quote. In the early, early 20th century, marijuana or marijuana, notice how it's spelled differently, but it's right there, uh, were primarily colloquial terms borrowed from Mexican Spanish. As the Brookings Institution's John Hudak explains in his book, Marijuana, A Short History. Uh, during and especially after the Spanish-American War, Hudak writes, American resentment towards Mexicans and Mexican immigrants exploded. Authorities who wanted to prohibit use of the drug soon discovered that associating it with Mexican immigrants was an effective propaganda tool. Uh, I won't make any judgments, but I'll say, does that sound familiar? Have you heard of anybody using that as a political wedge in the last few years? Well, let's go to the next slide. In 1937, after that uh, act was enacted, uh, the movies uh, took over and were pretty popular. And these are three titles of the same movie, Tell Your Children. Oh, I'm sorry, no, these are different movies, but Tell Your Children was one. Marijuana was another. Assassin of Youth was another one. Part of that propaganda uh, effort that I just referred to earlier in that quote. And it, later on, Reefer Madness was actually the one that uh, rebranded uh, Tell Your Children. And Doped Youth was a rebrand for Tell Your Children. And The Burning Question was a rebrand for Tell Your Children. So let's go to the next slide. We're gonna zoom up into the 1950s. This is Pan Am. So airlines were just uh, becoming very popular and there were a lot of things that were given out on those flights. If you can look at service items, you'll see that it says right in there, I think, um, uh, Benzedrine inhalers. They were given out for free. Notice there's not even a price there. And there's a sample Benzedrine inhaler on the right-hand side. That's an amphetamine, free and used in public and not illegal. Okay, let's go to the next slide. It's a poll question. Uh, there's a, a CBD product shown in the next slide that's on the market in New York. Has it been evaluated or approved by the FDA? And I don't know if anybody can see it because it's, is it blocked out by the poll question? but it's a little bottle with a dropper on top and it says gone green hemp oil. There it is. Do we have good results, Jessica? We have three yeses, 11 noes. <laughs> well, I think that it's kind of a trick question and, and not really fair, but it does say in very small print, if you can see in the bottom here, it's not evaluated or approved by the FDA. And so uh, the point is that it's unregulated right now in the New York state market and the federal market as well. It's hemp oil, so it comes from the, the cannabis plant and it might even come from Ken uh, Kentucky originally, who knows. Uh, but the FDA does not regulate this product but because it's not theoretically a food item. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we're up to 1970 now. That's when the Controlled Substances Act was enacted. And as we discussed before, the term in there is not cannabis, but it's marijuana. It's criminalized and it's on Schedule One. And there's another compound called tetrahydrocannabinols that are also on the list of Schedule One substances. So next slide. Let's go to 2014. This is when a federal agricultural act came about. It's called the Farm Bill from 2014. It authorized state departments of agriculture to regulate the production of industrial hemp. And that's the term industrial hemp. I think it's a reference more towards how it used to be used for textiles and fabric and industrial purposes. 
uh, anyway, the, the law authorized states to start pilot programs. And next slide. Industrial hemp in that federal act was defined as any plant part that didn't contain more than 0.3% of, well, a compound is Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, cannabinol, but it's THC, that's the psychoactive substance in the cannabis plant. So if it's less than 0.3%, it's not cannabis as you might think, it's, it's more industrial hemp. Let's go to the next slide. And here's just an example of, of how it was used for rope. And so what we're really talking about with hemp is rope, fabric, and CBD products. Next slide. Now, New York State got involved in the pilot program and uh, the Agriculture and Markets Law enacted a way for the Department of Agriculture and Markets to regulate and license the growth, cultivation, and sale of hemp to anyone for purposes other than for the use of cannabinoid content. So this means that Department of Agriculture and Markets, a state agency in New York, sells or helps sell uh, uh, hemp plants, seeds, and has established some restrictions and some requirements for the sale of hemp. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So with this poll question, which state is a major producer of cannabinoid hemp? Iowa, Kentucky, Texas, and Hawaii. So far, think, Kentucky's winning. Yeah, and, and Kentucky is winning. Is it winning because I foreshadowed that it should be the winner? Uh, I did foreshadow that. But my, my implicit point, I think, is that Mitch McConnell is from Kentucky. And the Republicans and the Senate have been pretty much anti-drugs and pro-drug war. Yet here is something for Kentucky where the cannabis plant, uh, in terms of hemp production, is made legal by the federal 20 uh, 14 farm bill. So next slide. Now there was a 2018 uh, farm bill as well. And it's, it's got great regulations and it's completely in effect thanks to Mitch McConnell. Uh, this one uh, has actually put away with the, uh, done away with the pilot program and has sort of revised the term too. So it's not industrial hemp anymore, it's just hemp. And it, it basically allows even more states and entities or farmers within states to uh, grow hemp and then process it for use in the three products we've been talking about, CBD, rope and fabrics, et cetera. Okay, next slide. Uh, the uh, 2018 Farm Bill also uh, authorized the United States government to uh, oversee hemp production in states that didn't submit a plan to the federal government. And New York has not submitted a plan to date. So New York is still existing under its pilot program, but that will go out of existence at the end of 2021. And next slide will show something. Um, let's see. Oh, I wanted to mention this. The, the 2018 Farm Bill also modified the Federal Controlled Substances Act so that hemp is excluded from it expressly. Uh, so marijuana and those other things, tetrahydrocannabinols, do not include hemp. And so Kentucky and all of its hemp uh, manufacturers will have a, a way to do this legally. Uh, let's go to the next slide. New York uh, does have a uh, cannab cannabinoid hemp uh, program, and it's through the Department of Health. It's something that was enacted in statute in 2020. The rules and regulations that implement this are pending. And uh, it, it is really intended for human consumption. Uh, whatever product is designed for human consumption or application has to be then put through this process of the Department of Health's regulations. Uh, next slide. Is that the end? That's, That's the, the end. end of the slide. So I, I wanted to leave you with, with one thing before we could turn the, uh, the stage here over to Nicole. Um, I think that there's a, a new bill that Axel's working on that will uh, impact a lot of this. And what I just went through probably won't change much with respect to the different licenses for the manufacturing, processing, and sale of cannabinoid hemp. Uh, it'll, but it'll be there and it'll, it'll just sort of move everything over into that new bill. Um, my point with history was that uh, 
transitions occur. And you know, this isn't a talk about being stoned. It's, it's really a talk about rectifying a social problem, a social injustice and a public health issue. And I think there are some good things about the social equity program that are about to come if the bill gets enacted. So that's all I have to say. And Nicole, you're next. I'm sorry I went a little long. Okay. So Jessica, do you have my slides to display? I do. I'm gonna start sharing it right now. Let me know if you can see it. Thank you. I can see it now, thank you. So thank you um, everyone for the opportunity to be here and talk about um, one of my favorite subjects. Um, I have to say that in my professional career, the opportunity to implement New York's medical cannabis program was the uh, most amazing and rewarding opportunity. And I hope as I go through these slides, you will all understand um, you know, the significant impact that this program has had since um, its implementation and that you'll learn more about um, where things will be going. Next slide, please. Um, so before I get into the medical cannabis program, I wanna talk a little bit about what cannabis is and a little bit about the pharmacology. Um, it's not my attempt to put you all to sleep this evening <laughs> with a lot of um, scientific background, but I do think it's important to understand some of this as it definitely plays a role in, um, you know, what you can see with, um, you know, what we have in the program today and why, um, you know, certain things are an obstacle such as uh, research. So um, cannabis refers to products derived from the plant cannabis sativa. Um, it contains natural compounds called cannabinoids and the main cannabinoids are THC, tetrahydrocannabinol and CBD, cannabidiol. And I know Rick touched upon the THC being the one known for the psychoactive effects. Um, there are well over a hundred different cannabinoids that have been identified. Um, THC was actually identified by a scientist in Israel, Raphael McCoolum, the godfather of cannabis. Um, if you ever Google him, there's quite a bit of information and research out there that um, he is responsible for in you know, advancing the science behind this. So um, going back, some cannabis contains very little THC. And as Rick described in his presentation that uh, less than 3% on the THC is where we draw the line between the um, industrial hemp and the, the medical cannabis program. So um, the 3% or more classified as marijuana. Again, we go into the medical cannabis program. And uh, one more point, the aroma um, that's tied to cannabis. The compounds that are responsible for that are called terpenes. Uh, next slide. So we all have what's called an endocannabinoid system. So within our bodies, we have these receptors that are in different areas throughout the body, um, including within our central nervous system and within other organs. We also have what's called endogenous or internally produced endocannabinoids that actually work with these receptors and produce different effects. Um, and these endocannabinoids in the system basically impact different things like pain, perception, mood, appetite, and memory. And this is where the pharmacology sort of leads us to the, um, the reason why we've got a medical cannabis program. So endocannabinoid um, deficiencies have been linked to the pathology associated with different conditions. So, um, now, when we talk about cannabis, THC um, does have the psychoactive effects, which we talked about, and that's um, been linked to its activation of what I mentioned before, the CB1 receptors, which are found in our body, primarily in the central nervous system. CBD actually impacts how that THC binds with the receptors and may counteract some of the psychoactive effects of the THC. Next slide, please. So there are different methods of consuming cannabis. Um, you know, if um, you inhale cannabis through smoking or vaporization, the effects are most rapid. Whereas if you are consuming cannabis orally, 
the onset is uh, more delayed, but also more prolonged. Um, in the medical cannabis program, um, there are different forms that are approved today, but I'll get into that later. Um, the onset of effect, um, again, is delayed with oral. So drug interactions actually may exist because of the way cannabis is broken down. Um, our bodies have what's called cytochrome, cytochrome P450 enzymes. And um, two of the enzymes that are responsible for the metabolism of THC and two that are responsible for CBD are also responsible for breaking down um, other pharmaceutical agents. So what can happen sometimes is that if there is an interaction, the ability to break down the cannabis may be delayed resulting in um, you know, a, a more prolonged onset of effects or um, a reaction. However, there's really more study that needs to be done there. Cannabinoids do accumulate in our fatty tissues and they reach peak concentrations in four to five days. It does take possibly up to 30 days to completely eliminate cannabis. So this is um, sort of the science behind what you probably have heard um, where someone may have um, tested positive for cannabis consumption, but the consumption occurred um, a long time ago. So that's again, tied to the science behind the, the way that the cannabinoids are eliminated from the system. Another key point is that fatal overdose is unlikely. I'm not aware of any reports of overdose that are directly associated with cannabis. Um, there are effects that can be seen with doses that are too high for an individual, such as anxiety, paranoia, increased heart rate, hallucinations, nausea, or vomiting. There's also a syndrome called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, which has popped up um, recently in some articles where um, some patients um, experience that. And um, there have been a couple of reports of emergency room visits tied to that, but it's not it's not the norm, it's more of a, a unique adverse effect where we're learning more about it as more um, information is shared. Next slide, please. So this map shows the different state cannabis programs and in the bright green, which you can see with New York State, um, these are the states that have comprehensive medical cannabis programs. California started us off in 1996 as the first state to legalize medical cannabis. There are 36 states and four territories. Um, so you can see a lot of green on that map. <laughs> um, I did read that Mississippi's measure is being challenged. That was um, most recent. I'm not sure where they stand with that, but um, as of now they're included in that 36. Next slide, please. So in New York State, the Compassionate Care Act was signed into law by Governor Cuomo in July of 2014. This introduced legalization of medical cannabis in New York State. Um, and this was critical because before we had a medical cannabis program, what we saw was there were many patients, um, children with seizure disorders, um, people suffering from terminal cancer and other terminal illnesses they were going to other states to obtain cannabis to relieve their, their pain and suffering. Um, so this, this law really afforded an opportunity for New Yorkers to be able to access medical cannabis um, and for us to set forth a program that would balance the needs of public, um, excuse me, the needs of protecting public health and safety while making cannabis available to New Yorkers. So there was an 18 month implementation timeframe and on time patients in New York state were able to purchase medical cannabis. Next slide. So this slide gives you a summary of how the program in New York works. Um, and it is different in the different medical cannabis states that we have. So I think it's important to understand the current landscape, especially as we look at you know, proposed legislation and understanding what are the nuances and how, how will things evolve? Um, so practi practitioners complete a New York State Department approved course. They register with the department, which allows them to issue a certification to patients who have serious conditions. 
You'll notice I said issue certifications to patients. I did not say prescribe medical cannabis to patients. Um, since the medical cannabis is a Schedule One controlled substance, prescribers cannot issue prescriptions like they would for other uh, pharmaceutical agents. However, they can make recommendations in the form of a certification to a patient. Patients receive these certifications and they register with the Department of Health for a registry ID card, which allows them to buy medical cannabis products from any registered organization in New York State. Registered organizations are responsible for manufacturing medical cannabis, as well as dispensing medical cannabis to the patients or their designated caregivers. Next slide, please. So this slide here shows you the implementation pathway. Um, and I think this is unique in that, you know, it's not always put together in what you um, see or hear about. And it really shows, you know, a lot of what went into this. So the law was signed. There's a lot that has to happen before patients can actually receive medical cannabis. After the law was signed, we drafted regulations that were published and ready for public comment at the end of December of that same year. April 15th of 2015, those regulations were adopted. So as that was going on, there's also the need to identify the registered organizations who would be manufacturing and dispensing medical cannabis. Uh, so an application process was released on April 27th um, for entities who are interested in becoming a registered organization to apply. And I remember that date because it's also my birthday. <laughs> um, and July 31st, 2015 was when five applicants were selected to become registered organizations here in New York State. So that was in July of 2015, and we had that 18-month implementation time frame. So they had a lot. However, they only had a few months left before we needed to be able to have cannabis in the hands of patients who have been waiting for this to relieve their um, pain and suffering. So there was a lot of work to be done, and it, it was done in that short time frame. So um, after those registered organizations were registered, uh, we also had a course that we worked on for the um, prescribers to be able to take in order to register, as well as the launch of a system that allowed those prescribers to certify patients and for patients to register. And then the dispensing began on January 7th. So doesn't look like a lot of boxes on the screen, but there's a lot that goes into each to make things happen. Next slide, please. Okay, audience polling question, true or false, any patient qualifies for medical cannabis in New York State? We're getting all falses. Ah, oh, good, I can stop now and go watch some TV, huh? <laughs> you all know the answers. Next slide, please. Okay, so the answer is false because public health law does define the term serious condition. And the regulations um, in Title 10, Part 1004 also include the serious conditions and clinically associated conditions that are set forth in public health law, as well as those that are added by the Commissioner of Health and Regulation. Um, and I have these two parts listed because in public health law, it does you know, provide the Commissioner the ability to add serious conditions and um, those additions are in regulation, whereas you won't find them in 3360 public health law. Next slide, please. So what are the serious conditions that a patient must have in order to qualify? I'm not going to read all of these to you, but you can see them here. And in the red font are actually those conditions that were added after the um, initial um, legislation was introduced with the Compassionate Care Act. So chronic pain was added in regulation in March of 2017. PTSD was signed into law on November 11th, 2017. Emergency regulations from July of 2018 were introduced, allowing for any condition for which an opioid can be prescribed, as well as substance use disorder. So you can see some progression and growth there. Um, also important to note with the um, 
you know, the opioid epidemic here in New York State and, you know, the alarming overdoses, the ability to have this alternative for patients to help relieve pain and suffering, you know, is really critical. Another tool in the toolbox for prescribers to use for their patients as they're weighing the risks versus the benefits. Next slide, please. So the other piece is the serious condition must be clinically associated um, with one of the conditions you see here. Next slide, please. This slide here is from the Department of Health's two-year report on the medical use of marijuana. Um, this is from the 2018 report. While it is a little bit dated, I do like this slide because it shows you a couple of things. One, 56.4% of the users of medical cannabis in this program are over the age of 50. In the beginning, we talked a little bit about pharmacology as well as drug interactions. And as a pharmacist, one of the things that, you know, I key into is with an aging population also comes additional medications, you know, something to treat your cholesterol, something to treat your high blood pressure, something to treat um, your COPD or other, you know, chronic conditions. And you could have somebody who, you know, who is on six or seven different medications and having a medical cannabis program allows um, the opportunity for that additional medical oversight while providing the patient an alternative and, you know, again, balancing the risks and benefits and looking at you know, what medications the patient may be on and, and what might be of concern. The other thing I'd like to point out, which really makes me passionate about this program is not only, you know, are we looking at a lot of, you know, elderly patients who are in this program, but also very young patients. You can see in the age bracket of zero to five, 59 were certified for cancer. Um, 119 certified for chronic pain, epilepsy, 72 patients. And again, offering something that relieves that pain and suffering makes a huge difference for family members where nothing else, you know, may have been working. So I, I just think this is a, a really critical slide here just to show the, the diversity and the, the age groups that this program serves. Next slide, please. Hey, and Nicole, can I just jump in really quick? Uh, Jessica, I'm not sure, what are we doing on time here? How, how are you, is it cut off at seven? What's, what was the plan? Um, we can just keep going until everyone's done and, and anyone that's in the audience, you know, feel free to leave if you have to leave. But um, I know that we still have a couple more slides to go, so. I can do an express version here so we can give Axel some stage time. <laughs> no, no, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I think this is far more interesting than the stuff I'm gonna talk about. So um, I'm just trying to plan my own uh, schedule here. Uh, so we'll go ahead, uh, go ahead, Nicole. Okay, uh, true or false, any prescriber who is authorized to issue prescriptions can certify patients for medical cannabis. Okay. We have whenever you're ready. More we have 11 falses, four trues. Okay, next slide. So the answer is false because public health law specifically defines the term practitioner. Uh, so the practitioner is defined um, and then the regulations actually, you know, further define those requirements. Next slide, please. And this basically shows you the breakdown of that definition. So uh, because the term physician is used in uh, public health law, uh, that eliminates your, for example, your podiatrists who do not fall under article 131 of the education law. Next slide, please. Another polling question. I feel like this one was written like a professor with the may nots. <laughs> Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, we have, oh, another person voted. Um, okay, we have two votes for A, zero for B, two for C, 12 for D. Okay, next slide. 
And the answer is D, they may not dispense medical cannabis to a patient who is not registered with the program, meaning I can't just walk into a dispensary and purchase medical cannabis. Next slide, please. So registered organizations, again, are the entities that manufacture and dispense. I went over that earlier, so we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but they are held to certain requirements, including laboratory testing, labeling, and packaging. Next slide, please. Next question. True or false, a patient with a New York State Registry ID card may lawfully possess medical cannabis that was not obtained from a registered organization in New York State. We're getting all falses. Very good. We can just move on <laughs> to, to slide 22. That's correct. So one more piece I'd like to mention about um, the law, the Compassionate Care Act and Article 33 here is that there are protections as it relates to um, not being subject to arrest, prosecution, or penalty, or denied any right or privilege, provided that um, you know solely for the certified medical use or manufacture of marijuana, or for any other action in conduct or conduct in accordance with the title. Next slide. So this one, hopefully, is all the right answer. Does the medical cannabis program go away with adult use legislation? We're getting all falses. Very good. Next slide. So the answer is no. <laughs> um, I mentioned before we have that population that's under the age of 21. I also talked about the importance of um, medical oversight in certain pa patients. You've got your um, over 50 or you know patients that may have complicated conditions with complicated pharmacotherapy. Um, some of the things in the Cannabis Regulation and Taxation Act that would be changing for the medical cannabis program would be um, the Office of Cannabis Management providing the oversight, which I'm not going to talk about because Axel can go into more detail about that. Um, new conditions being added. Uh, definition of practitioner is actually modified so that all prescribers of controlled substances um, who are authorized to treat those conditions can... Um, certify patients and um, and the registered organizations being able to participate in the adult use program. So I'm gonna turn it over to Axel at this point so he can talk to you some more about the adult use program and, and what's going on there. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see the new slides? Or is it still the PowerPoint? It's the new slides, the white and the blue ones. Thank you. Well, um, so I'm happy to talk about this. You, you guys are getting more than you bargained for. And I, you know, we could spend a whole hour just on, on this as well. And I'm not sure how interesting it is. So uh, I'll kind of go quickly and then maybe open it up for questions. And then if there are questions, we can come back to, uh, to some of the slides. So, um, but just to, uh, to set the stage, what yeah what we're doing is i'll tell you really quickly about the proposal that we put forth over the last couple of years to um to uh it's called the crta the cannabis regulation and taxation act which would legalize adult use uh, use of cannabis in the state of new york but also um regulate you know kind of under one office the medical program and hemp so you heard about hemp from rick and you heard about the medical program from nicole and so those, those have been going as separate programs and now they're going to be united under a new section. Is this, are, 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 are folks on the phone lawyers or no, it's a bit of everybody, right? This isn't the law or is everybody mostly law? law mostly law students. All right, okay, great. Well, so we're, created a new, we're creating a new section of consolidated law, which you don't get to do very often. So normally you stick the laws in existing laws, the public health law, the labor law. Here, we're creating a whole new cannabis law. So it's gonna be a new, you know, McKinney's book on cannabis and under that law, that consolidated law section, you're going to have medical, you're going to have adult use, and you're going to have hemp all under one new office. So that's what I'm going to talk about really quickly. And we're negotiating that right now as we speak and hoping we can get it done over the next several weeks. But um, thank you. So just broadly, what, what's happened in the last uh, sort of 20 years, but really 
10 years at an accelerated pace is that we've shifted our perspective on uh, drug, uh, drug control, uh, driving or moving away from criminalization of drug policy. So putting people in jail for using drugs uh, as a way of trying to get them to stop using drugs, that just hasn't worked. Um, and we've moved towards a public health framework in, in terms of, uh, this is mainly for adult use. What Nicole's been talking about is people that need medicine. So unfortunately, as, as Rick pointed out, criminalization had a bunch of unintended consequences. And so now we're trying to deal with those things. But when it comes to adult use, we're thinking a public health framework of harm, harm reduction, essentially. So if you tax and regulate and dictate where things can be sold and, and what kind of things can be sold, you're better off and you have a better outcome than trying to drive it underground with, with criminalization of drug policy. So, so everything we, you know, we have, we call them the three legs uh, of the stool. What we're trying to achieve with adult use and this, this, this big omnibus bill, this large 250 page bill that we're trying to pass through the legislature with the uh, governor's office is we're trying to achieve three goals. One, we wanna ensure public health and safety. Uh, we wanna achieve social justice and social equity. And we want to ensure economic development for all parts of the state. So, but all that is done through a, a, a kind of public health lens. Next slide, if, if you know, this is high level, really high level, but if, if you're at all interested in regulatory law, what, what you discover, um, maybe less in law school, I find, but after when you're working in government, is that every sort of product has its own regulatory pathway. There are all sorts of rules and regulations surrounding. Uh, cigarettes, uh, firearms, uh, food products. Every agency has their sets of regs and regula you know, regulations. And, and what's fascinating about the cannabis plant, and you've heard a little bit about it from Rick, about hemp and, and, and Nicole about medical, is that the cannabis plant really covers sort of six different, entirely different regulatory pathways. You know, some people grow cannabis for industrial purposes because the fiber is really good for some biocomposites and for textiles. And there's uh, oils that you can use for varnishes. There's all sorts of um, uh, industrial applications. There are foods which aren't, uh, you know, the extracts that we've been talking about. There, there, there are seeds, hemp oil. Um, it's really high in, in omegas and uh, it's actually very nutritious. So it's, it's got, and, and the food is taken care of, the USDA takes care of food and the FDA does as well. There's a whole regulatory pathway around there. Then there's the health and wellness and the cosmetics, which, which are dietary supplements that are regulated under federal law and the FDA again. And they have all their rules about how you can manufacture, how you can advertise, how you can sell these products. And, and that's yet another, a whole other regulatory pathway. Then you have a recreational product. Which, which I'm talking about more today. And you're talking about alcohol and cigarettes and they have their own regulatory pathway and we're trying to create a brand new one for that. You have the medical pathway that, that, that Nicole told you about, but that's not really the pharmaceutical, which is a separate one. The, the medical one Nicole told you about is a quasi pharmaceutical. It's where Nicole set up essentially a mini FDA in the State Department of Health and was doing pre-market approval of products, was trying to determine what conditions medical marijuana should be used for, was trying to understand what was safe and efficacious outside of the usual clinical trial process that pharma does in the FDA. So really fascinating. And we're trying to reconcile all these. Under one bill, we're trying to create all these pathways and, and, and really regulate at the state level all the ways in which the cannabis plant's going to be sold. That's been an incredibly uh, fascinating challenge and, and super, super interesting. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so kind of quickly, what we're doing, as I said, is we're creating a new office of cannabis management. So it's, uh, it's gonna have a board, it's gonna have um, you know, staff, it's gonna have all sorts of powers, uh, but it's, it's gonna control all these different aspects of, of the cannabis plant. All right, I think we're going to the polling question next. Should cannabis be legalized? So this is interesting. There's, there's no yes or no. There's no right or wrong answer on this. Um, but I'd love to get your, your opinion on this. Um, I'm curious to see of the folks that are on what they think. So far, everyone says yes. Okay. Well, that's consistent with what we're seeing in polls, especially the younger folks, which everybody seems to be on, on, on this call. Mm -hmm. um, there's a large support for, for moving away from criminalization and allowing for legalization. So, all right, next slide. So this is, um, 
Yeah, so this is Article 4. So we skipped the, the, the deck usually has Article 3, which is the medical program. It's what Nicole talked about. So, you know, the, the way this bill is structured is you first have Article 2, that's the office, Article 3, that's the medical program, then Article 4, which is the adult use program. So, again, there's a lot to talk about, and I don't know how much detail to get into, and uh, I'd rather have questions come back. But there's uh, what we call the market architecture. So when you legalize a product like this, you have to think like alcohol. Alcohol we have a two-tier system where if you if you're Budweiser and you manufacture beer, we're, we're not going to let you own the Budweiser bar or the Budweiser liquor store. We break that up legally. If you're one section or section of the market, you can't be in the other section of the market. So we're thinking of doing that. We are proposing to do that as well in the in the cannabis space, and that that creates some interesting questions about about the types of entities that are going to be participating. And you know, happy to answer questions about that. There are going to be a lot of license types. So when you think about growing cannabis, it's a lot more complicated than you might think at first. You have large cultivators, indoor cultivators with all sorts of hydroponics and complexities. You have micro businesses, small growers that maybe, you know, folks that are illicit growers that are coming into the, the legal market for the first time, because you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to put all these folks that were working in the gray market out of business and create a huge problem in these communities by destroying a shadow economy that was still supplying the community with a lot of money. So we're trying to we're trying to get folks that are currently in the market illicitly to gravitate over to the illicit market, which is a challenge from a public, from a public pers uh, policy perspective. You have co-ops, you know, uh, cooperatives, you have processors that are extracting, distributors that are distributing, retail stores that are selling, you have delivery, and all of these have their conditions and their, their limitations and their duties and obligations. So a lot of economics in this, which is really quite fascinating. If you like law and economics, which is my background, I'm an antitrust attorney by training. You know, this, this stuff, you can really wonk out on this stuff. We're going to have selection criteria. How do you do it? How do you choose who gets a license? How do you do that when you want to have a social and economic um, equity plan? So you, you want to encourage and incentivize the folks that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs that have been har harmed by 30 years or 60 years of criminalization. You know, in New York alone, we have 800,000 people that have been arrested for marijuana possession, mostly low level. And it will come as no surprise to know that most of those are black and brown folks. And so what do you do about trying to remedy the, the harms of the past? How do you make sure that some, some of these folks get access to these licenses and that these licenses are apportioned to smaller businesses so as many people can participate as possible? These are all the challenges we have in trying to set up the program. But it's also a really exciting opportunity to invest money, resources, reinvest money in communities that, you know, that are suffering, that that are traditionally where you would find, you know, not only uh, social uh, inequities, but also health inequities. So it's a real, you know, we're talking about a business that we estimate to be anywhere from three to $4 billion. So large, large economic business creating six, you know, 60,000 new jobs, generating hundreds of millions of dollars of tax revenue. That's a real economic engine. So how do you re, you know, redirect those resources and those opportunities into the communities that, that, that need them? So from a, from a social justice and social equity perspective, it's a very, very exciting file um, and, and, and a lot of fun to work on because it's not very often that you get you know, new money for these kinds of initiatives. So that, that's uh, this slide. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, I won't spend too much time on this, but you, know, you have to tax. You, you, you have to create a brand new tax structure. Um, and there are a lot of ways you can do it. Do you tax the weight? Do you tax it at wholesale and distribution? Like alcohol, nobody knows, but you know, nobody knows. People buy alcohol at the, at the liquor store, but they don't know that the government at the distribution level, before you even see it, you don't really pay anything more than sales tax at the, at the, at the liquor store. But before that happens, you have all sorts of wholesale taxes that get built in. So they drive up the price of alcohol because we want alcohol to stay a little bit more expensive. You don't want the really, really cheap alcohol because we think from a public health perspective, it's good to have it be a little bit more expensive. So same thing here. We want to keep the prices a little higher. And in the end, this is a weed, right? I mean, there's a, there's a reason we call it weed is because it grows like a weed. And so the cost of production is going to plummet. And when you get California and Oregon that have oversupply that start to sell into New York, the prices are going to be so low. So how do we create a tax structure that's, that supports a, 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 a you know, price base and that protects uh, both from public health, but from state revenue protects us from uh, you know, erosion uh, in that sense. So we're looking at a THC tax that can get complicated and it'll be for another time, but very interesting. If you like tax policy, if you like law and taxation, 
then this is a really interesting file for you as well. Next, next slide. This is, I, I mentioned this quickly. This is the, you know, uh, the fund, you know, with the number of licenses. Uh, uh, we can skip this one. I kind of talked about it. Traffic safety. So, you know, this is another policy issue. Just, I, I have a couple of policy issues lined up here really quickly that, that, that highlight the complexity of this file. So once you start dealing with legalizing cannabis, well, what do we do about the fact that people may be driving that are impaired by cannabis use? Uh, you know, you might say that when you're high, you drive a little slower, but even driving a little slower is, is a potential, uh, is a potential uh, traffic, um, traffic, uh, you know, problem. Um, and so we don't have, we don't actually have any mechanism, any breathalyzer to test uh, THC content in the blood or recent use of THC. And so we have to rely on other mechanisms that we have at our disposal. So you know, drug recognition experts, for example, that can come on site and tell whether someone's intoxicated or impaired. Um, you know, so we have to build a set of laws around that to make sure that we deal with traffic safety as we roll this out. Um, and so we're doing that and, and that, that, uh, that's a challenging file. And go to the next part of the slide. All right, polling question number two. Should cannabis be decriminalized such that possession of small quantities is not a misdemeanor or felony, huh? I suspect the answer will be yes if people believe in decriminalization. I mean, yeah, we'll, yeah. We have all all yeses. Yeah. So what this highlights is um, is is a really interesting question about what decriminalization means. If, if you want to remove penalties for possession and sale of of cannabis then, and you want to create a legal system, you know, it's hard to do both sometimes without having a penalty for selling illegal weed. So how do you penalize people that are not selling in the tax and regulate system without recriminalizing? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. So, you know, how much is too much pot on you? How much is too much pot at home? How much is too much pot um, in, in terms of a sale? Um, you know, how much, should, how should you be penalized if you sell to someone who's under 21? These are all really difficult criminal law questions that, that you have to balance between decriminalization and um, legalization, but in a, in, a, in a formal and tax and regulate system. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this one, I'm curious to hear what folks think. Oh, well, actually, I would have made it slightly different. What's the answer on this? I'm assuming it's yes for the most part. Pretty much all yes, one no. Yeah, so I think the question that's harder here would be, should smoking cannabis be allowed outdoors or should it be allowed in the same places that smoking tobacco is? You could say yes to vape because it has no smell, but you know, if any of you have been around the smell of burning cannabis, it can get pretty pungent. And for some folks, it can be uh, it can be a little disconcerting or a bit of a nuisance. In fact, we have that even with our hemp growers, where they grow fields of hemp, and people complain that the smell, especially around October when the harvest comes in, is overpowering. The smell of weed can be extremely strong. So uh, right now, the idea is is that you'd be able to consume cannabis uh, where you can smoke, uh, but we have to still uh, resolve that in the bill and negotiate that. What's the next slide? Another poll. Ah, darn it. I didn't know that was coming. If not, I wouldn't have given it away. It's a secret poll, so feel free to contradict me. We got mostly no's, one yes, or sorry, mostly yeses, one no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next question or next. Uh... Ah, so I've been jumping around. Um, this is the criminal justice that I was talking about. That poll question got me talking about this. Um, um, so, you know, here the legal possession of the of up to one ounce. Um, we're looking at you can essentially buy an ounce from a store. You can walk around maybe with a couple of ounces, and then what are you going to be able to have at home? You know, um, one of the big questions that's a very difficult one is allowing home grow. So do you allow people to grow their own plants at home? That's a very controversial issue because 
you know, plants can produce a lot of, you know, an average plant can produce one or two pounds. And so, you know, a lot of jurisdictions allow people to grow at home and you can grow five or six plants at home, five or six plants, each growing one or two pounds. And you can grow, you know, several, several of them a year, you can grow 20, 30, 40 pounds of weed at home. And that's, that's a pretty uh, valuable crop with a pretty high street market value. So it makes it difficult again, to try to incentivize um, the use of a tax and regulate system when you have that going on. So next slide. Oh yeah, interesting. So for the non-criminal folks on this, what this really means is, um, is if you were arrested on a low level marijuana charge, should your, um, you know, your arrest or your conviction immediately be sort of disappeared and destroyed. Um, I'm assuming most people said yes to that one. Yeah. Most people put yes. That's what we're going to be doing next. Yeah, so this is interesting too. So this is similar again to the tra driving. A lot of comments we got and a lot of concerns we got is what happens if someone smokes a joint and then goes to work? So you're not smoking a joint at work but you get, you get into the office a little high. Now lawyers uh, are probably not you know, gonna be the first in line to do that because if you're trying to do the law when you're you know, intoxicated is probably more difficult than other professions, but there are professions where uh, folks may try to do that or there are jobs where you could have real risks if somebody did come in. So we struggled with this to make sure that we struck the right balance between not discriminating against someone that, you know, for being a stoner, right? Because some people are still judgmental on the fact that you may be consuming. And so we didn't want employers to be able to discriminate and say, I'm not gonna hire you or I'm gonna fire you because you smoke, you know, marijuana at home, but also allowing that employer to say that marijuana is, in, is, is sort of interfering with your ability to do your work at the office. And so having them uh, be able to take action where there was, uh, where there was impairment at the office and so we, we sort of mirrored the law, which uh, is under 201D of the labor law, which is uh, related to um, employment uh, and alcohol. So, you know, there are sort of, pro, there, there are uh, balancing factors, which, you know, the, 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 the employer has to show a certain amount of impairment and there are certain presumptions and there are certain rebuttals. And so it's, it's a pretty effective system and we're hoping it'll work. Uh, for cannabis as well. So I'm going on and on. So let's see what the next ones are real quick. Uh, we're going to do a public health and education campaign. That's, that's huge. I mean, it's one thing to use recreational. It's another thing to consume, you know, daily or near daily. And there are a lot of people that do that. And they're, you know, now you have dab rigs. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, but shatter and wax and high potency uh, concentrates that folks are doing, which really are probably not what you want to be doing. Uh, from a health perspective. And so we're gonna educate folks on that. And what's the last slide on that? Oh, this is, a, this is another issue, right? Not everybody wants to have a retail store or a pot store on Main Street. And so how do you allow jurisdictions to opt out? How do you allow somebody, a town or a village that doesn't wanna have a retail store, uh, the ability to, to say, hey, not here, not, not right now at least. And so you have to develop a mechanism for that and we're trying to do that is it at the county level is it the town level is it the you know is it the village level and do you need to do a referendum or can it be just the board vote so there's a there's an interesting political question surrounding that we're we're drafting some legal language in the bill that would cover that so that that's what that's about i think that sort of sums it up right yep that was the last slide okay so that's a big picture so i just you know again i went really quickly but all these are moving parts in the bill, which is 250 pages and um, a lot to cover, but a really, really fascinating question from a legal perspective, a lot of interesting questions uh, from a legal perspective. So I hope that was um, fun uh, to hear and I will put myself on mute and let folks ask questions. So I didn't get any questions in the chat, but if you have any, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. I just have a question. Richie, go for it. Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks. Um, I just have a question. If there's anything in the bill that allows um, people to like grow their own and like certain limited amounts or is it just for certain businesses right now? 
Yeah, that's 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 the home grow I was talking about. That's right now. Um, the legislature would allow home grow. Ours didn't. You know, there's there's talk about whether it would be allowed for medical or uh, whether it'd be for small uh, amounts. That's actually still just being negotiated. We'll have to see. Um, but I was trying to highlight the pros and cons on either side. You know, there's it, it's a difficult one. It's not necessarily a, an easy one to to weigh. So we'll see where we come out. No decision's been made on that yet. Um, Kelsey, this is Rick. I'm curious about which way you would like to see it come out. Um, personally, I would like, I, I think that it would be good for people who either want to use it recreationally or for a medical need to be able to grow their own because I know that it's probably very expensive and a lot of people travel to different states or like to Canada to get it and so it might give them a cheaper alternative. That's all true. Bevin, go for it. Um, hi, Bev. Uh, what kind of timeline were you guys looking for the legislation? Like, how soon would this be implemented? I don't know if I just missed that. No, I mean, I mentioned the, the, um, the, the, the way this usually happens is sort of within the budget. That's, that's typically how you do it because there, there are a lot of, there's taxation, there's revenue, uh, there are expenditures. And so the budget in New York gets done by April 1st. So this would uh, get done by April 1st. Once you, once you pass the legislation though, it's really the starting gun, not the finishing line. Unfortunately, it's a lot of work to get it over the line, but then you just start. And then you have to, there's a board, you have to pick the board. And you have to draft and issue the regulations. You have to get comment on the regulations. Then you have to issue an RFP for applications. Then you have to score the applications. And Nicole went through all of this. And so did Rick on the medical side. And we'd have to do it for the adult use side. And then you score the applications and then you start awarding it. So typically it's a 12 to 18 month period, you know, realistically before you can expect to have uh, from the date it's passed, you know, sort of before you can expect to have the first sales, at least, you know, that's a fairly aggressive timeline. You also have to establish a brand new agency, and it could be said that it's coming from scratch, but probably a lot of Department of Health people will be moved over, maybe some people from other agencies like tax or alcohol beverage control, but still just to set up a new agency and staff it and find a place to build it is, is a long process. It's all Nicole's team. It's, it's the, the, the entire team Nicole built over the last five years in the medical program is going to be the backbone for the adult use program. So all the folks she knows and handpicked. So, uh, yeah, they're all going to start this new one um, if it passes on April 1st. And I didn't have a team when I started mine. <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> Good to have a starting point. <laughs> The CRTA itself, I think, is effective immediately in most places, right, Axel? So anything that's related to hemp or medical marijuana will not be interrupted. It'll continue on, hopefully without hiccups, but uh, it'll take a while to transition to that new OCM agency. That's right. And actually on the medical program, you know, what Nicole could, could have gone, you know, there's so much to talk about on so many of these. It's just such a fascinating file. But we are expanding or the proposal that we put forth and the legislature has put forth too is to expand some of the medical programs. So it would expand the medical conditions. It would allow flour in the medical program, which has been a big source of contention. It would, um, it would uh, make it easier for, for referral, referring physicians to participate in the program. Um, so there, there'd be you know, an expansion of the program to allow it to be more accessible generally. So that, that would be a good thing for the medical program. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I was just wondering, what are the chances of it passing April 1st? Um, is, do you have enough political uh, will behind it? You know, that's, that's a tough call. I'm, I'm just the country lawyer on this file. So, you know, I don't, I don't make the decisions on the politics, but look, I think the legislature's put the MRTA out for, I think, eight years. We put it out for three years. The governor said that um, it's a priority. I think, uh, I think it's sort of time for it to, to get done. Um, the, the, the polls are in favor. Um, there's some, you know, some folks that are rightfully concerned about rollout, but I think we've, I, I tried to show in my slides that we've really thought through the, the public health and safety uh, components of this. So I, I think it's got a good chance of passing. Um, 
but you know, but you're right. It's, it's still a fairly controversial issue with a lot of moving parts. So there's a lot of ways in which it could get stalled for sure, but we'll know in three weeks, four weeks. Thank you. Ruchi? Um, thanks for coming, all of you, by the way. This has been really interesting. Um, I was wondering um, about regulation, I guess, on the, the science side of things. Um, when you're thinking about marijuana as like a medical drug, with other medical drugs, you have um, regulation um, in place to make sure that the drugs are safe and like doing what they're supposed to do. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that would look like which is also, I think, a way to alleviate people's concerns about it, which I realize is antithetical to growing your own in, in your backyard. Um, and I don't know too much about the drug and what how that would work. I can speak to the, the current landscape that exists today um, with the medical you know, cannabis program that we have. Um, if you do look at the regulations in Title 10, Part 1004, there are several requirements as it relates to the manufacturer that the registered organizations have to comply with. They do have to test every lot of medical marijuana product that is produced and it's the final product that they're testing, not the extract. Um, they're tested for contaminants as well as for the concentration um, of the main cannabinoids. Um, there are also labeling requirements that currently exist as it relates to the medical product, um, you know, for safety labeling. Um, and very similar to what you would see on a, a prescription as it relates to those labeling requirements, um, if you look at those in the regulations. Um, as it relates to the conditions, um, that's where it gets tricky um, in, you know, in determining which conditions should be included because of the obstacles that we have from the federal government. Um, as I mentioned before, it's still schedule one and the ability to obtain um, marijuana for research has been limited for the longest time to one producer in um, University of Mississippi. Um, and the feds did, I believe, open up an application process to allow additional um, growers, but last time I checked, I don't know if Rick or Axel have more recent information, the federal government hasn't approved any additional suppliers beyond University of Mississippi. Um, so that's where really the states, you know, and, and having these programs allow us to collect data and to, to regulate and, um, you know, and implement these safety parameters to again balance the availability and allow um, people to weigh the risks versus the benefits. I think you're right, Nicole. Still, Mississippi is the only place where marijuana or cannabis for research can be uh, grown. But the federal government and the criminality that's associated with it is really related to interstate transport. So in New York State, and I think this is part of the CRTA that Axel's working on, there is a, a big section of the bill that would foster uh, research within New York State. So you could have research with cannabis grown in New York and then uh, applied through various testing, hypotheticals and mechanisms, scientific method uh, in New York State. And it, it's hoped that that will help the, the situation a lot. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I have one. Um, so, one. Of, I, so I work with um, Assemblymember Fahey, and one of the areas of concern right now is, for us, is the environmental impact. So I'm wondering if you know anything about that. If you are assessing the environmental impact, because I know in other states, like they're realizing that it actually used a lot of energy to grow cannabis. So I'm wondering if you could speak on that. Sure, again, yeah, that's a great point. Um, the, um, I mean, the carbon footprint all in is, is not, you know, it's still like any, uh, most other indoor crops, right? So if you're, if you're growing, it's just a lot of people grow it indoor. And so, uh, but it does have, it does have a pretty serious carbon footprint. We are absolutely looking at that. The bill clearly says that there's uh, uh, authority to set criteria uh, for the selection of licensees based on their footprint, essentially, based on their 
uh, environmental impact. So when we're going to be when the board is going to be de designing criteria for picking licensor licenses, the growers, for example, they're going to be assessing their uh, their environmental mitigation plan. So that that's first. You know, there's an obligation that the new uh, office uh, get together with the Department of uh, Environmental Conservation and Ag and Markets to develop protocols and standards in that regard. Um, and and quite frankly, just the type of licenses that that we're trying to we're we're going to issue, um, we want to incentivize the use of greenhouses, allow the use of outdoor grow. So you know those are much uh, less intensive ways of growing, and those are all the ways that I think you can reduce uh, the carbon footprint. So that's definitely a big piece of it. We've heard from a lot of folks on that. With regard to hemp, Jessica, that's designed to be a Department of Agriculture and Markets outdoor crop. And I don't know how many acres of uh, land uh, are used to grow hemp, but I think it's in the uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe, Axel. I mean, it's, it's quite a few acres right now, and it's getting bigger and bigger every year. And then on the back end, if there are uh, a lot of chemicals used uh, to grow hemp, it should be known that there's a huge lab analysis uh, procedure to make sure that those chemicals don't end up in the, uh, the final product or, or the processed product. So it's better not to put them in to begin with. So it's a good idea to not spread chemicals, for example, in the agricultural land to try to grow better hemp. So, so I, I can, just to follow up on what Rick's absolutely right on that. So first of all, as Nicole will tell you, the medical program doesn't allow the use of pesticides. So there's a lot of really cool sort of uh, natural ways of controlling for, for you know, bugs and, and molds and stuff. The hemp is actually, Rick, Rick's right, but it's even more interesting than that. It turns out the hemp plant is super uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, cannabis sativa, again, it's the same plant. It's super environmentally friendly for a couple of reasons. One, it's got deep roots that aerate the soil. Second, it tends to shoot up quickly and grow a canopy cover very fast. So you actually don't have a lot of weeds. So you don't need to use pesticides for that. It's very fast growing and very strong. So you have very low, very low pesticide use. You have uh, almost, not, almost none. You have very low water use. You have regenerative soil uh, uh, and, and uh, good crop rotation. And then what you can use the, you know, it's super efficient in what you can use it for. You use the herd for uh, animal bedding, you use the herd for pulp and paper, construction, uh, you use the fiber for cloth, for bioplastic, you use the seeds for food, you use the leaves for salads, you use the flour for medicine. It's, it's I mean, there is, there is so much we could talk about when it comes to the industrial uses of hemp. It is fascinating. Right now, there's a movement afoot to try to make it a sustainable crop that actually displaces the, the, the plastics industry so that you can start to make you know, biocomposites that are, that are out of uh, natural cellulose rather than out of uh, plastic. So I think we should be celebrating. I think it's important, Jessica, that we do have that, uh, that view and that we, especially on the high um, energy intensive uh, marijuana for you know, flower purposes, that we'd be, we'd be mindful. But it is, you know, it's tied to a regenerative movement that's actually pretty exciting. The whole thing kind of comes in a package. The, you know, the, the, the marijuana or cannabis industry generally tends to be fairly progressive on environmental issues. So, so it's, it's pretty synergistic. Thank you. So anyone else give you a second? I just have one more question um, about the process. So you mentioned like hopefully like certain records might be expunged or sentences um, might be like commuted. So is there a process in place for like how that'll happen or is it sort of like up in the air right now? Yeah, that's a little out of my league. You're right, it's complicated. So there's the difference between it happening automatically and folks having to apply to get it. And then there are obstacles to folks, you know with a criminal record getting access to the proper technique. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work. I know we're pushing to get it to be as um, as 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 efficient and as easy uh, as possible, but uh, it's not my bailiwick, unfortunately. So I probably can't give you the best of answers. That's okay. Thank you. 
so many pieces to it, right? So you got to be a tax lawyer, you got to be a labor lawyer, you got to be a criminal law lawyer, and a, you know, it's a health lawyer. So, and I'm just a health lawyer. So I sort of have to jump. Um, I think we can wrap up here. It was really nice to be on with everybody. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. And the two Richard Zunleiters were, were truly outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for uh, allowing us the opportunity to join you all and talk about this. Thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. Uh, it's been terrific. Maybe we'll see each other again on April 14th when the law school online graduate program has an even bigger and better presentation. We have another panel member that will add to us all, us group, our group uh, at that time. Yeah, and we'll be talking about the future a lot more too, you know, how, how this gets rolled out. So it'll, it'll be very, if this passes, it'll be a very exciting uh, presentation for sure. Yeah, all thank right. you. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, <laughs> Thanks for moving the slides along, Jessica. No problem. <laughs> Have a good night. Take care.